So hello and welcome to Windows and Time, Oregon Caves, our underground treasure presented by um, Sue Densmore, um, who is the executive director of the Friends of the Oregon Caves and Chateau. Um, I am Carrie Tannehill. I'm a librarian here at Medford, a for adult services librarian. And this program is sponsored by the Jackson County Library Services and the Southern Oregon Historical Society. Um, so just a few announcements about um, Southern Oregon Historical Society Research Library with its Vast amounts of regional history is now open by appointment Tuesdays through Friday from 1 to 4 p.m. Um, you will need to uh, either email your appointment request or um, call them during open library hours. And then our next Windows and Time program is on November 4th, um, 2020. So it'll be a Zoom meeting like this one from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And popular historian and lecturer Jeff Lalonde will share historic photographs and information about Bear Creek from Native American times to the presence, to the present. So if you wanna register for that Windows and Time program, visit jcls.org. And I just wanted to say that the views and opinions expressed in this program and of, are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. So thank you for attending today's program and I will give it over to Sue. Okay, good, uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and um, First of all, before we start, I just want to say a couple things about life at the Oregon Caves. We are um, starting, uh, tomorrow will be a month of um, an active fire around the monument. Um, and I just want to do a shout out to Jeremy Curtis, who is our superintendent, who has just done a remarkable job trying to keep his team safe, keep the community safe, and also save and protect the, not only the monument and the preserve, but the historic district there. So um, just keep him in your thoughts. Um, they are just an amazing group of people and we're so fortunate that we have Jeremy and his team up there. The other thing I wanted to say, which is a little sad note, is that if you knew um, Ron Fox, uh, he was a dear, dear, dear friend. Um, he um, was also a founder of the Friends and has been a supporter of the Oregon Caves uh, for 12 years. And he passed away of a heart attack very suddenly on September 18th. And so. Some of the things I'm going to talk about today will kind of honor uh, Ron. He, he just um, could not have been a more wonderful board member. He also was on the Rogue Community College Board of Directors and, and I just, we miss him desperately and um, just want to honor many of the things that happened with the Friends and the Oregon Caves are due to Ron's uh, incredible efforts. So I'm, as Carrie said, I'm Sue Densmore. I'm the Executive Director of the Friends of the Oregon Caves and Chateau. Our organization was formed in 2007 at that point, the Oregon Caves National Monument was at risk. Uh, our visitation had, had lessened and um, Fran Manella, then the um, head of the Park Service came to visit us. And then our superintendent, Craig Ackerman said, uh-oh, why is she here? And um, kind of, we did not get a clear idea of why she was here, but part of the thinking was that the, since the visitation had, had started to drop, uh, we needed some new energy at the Oregon Caves and some changes need to be made. And Ron Wyden, our senator, said, you know, what we really need is to show that the citizens care about the Oregon Caves as much as the Park Service does. So that was the purpose for starting the Friends. And it's kind of interesting to, to be a cave in this day because uh, much of um, global warming and many issues were under the ground. And so you can go down there and you can honor kind of the past like, like pioneers did. It's really a, a special, special place and actually becoming kind of more special as we watch uh, scientifically to some degree what's going on under the ground. So I want to hit a few top points, top um, um, uh, timelines here to tell you and then we'll talk more about this as we go on. Of course, the caves were discovered by Elijah Davidson in 1874. Um, it did not become a monument, however, until 1909 and we'll talk a little more about that later. The highway that you drive up now, um, Highway 48, was not built until 1922. So we did go to the caves by horseback um, through Holland and through um, Williams uh, before that time. And then, um, of course, the Chateau opened in 1934, and we'll talk more about that. And then the one of the most interesting things, I think, is that it took until 2014 for Congress to expand the monument from 400 acres 
to around 4,000 acres. In the beginning, it was planned to be larger than it was. And um, so now we are a, a, a monument and a preserve, which means we have two separate designations. And of course, now in 2020, after 12 years of pretty intense work, we are finally um, working on the Life Safety and Accessibility Project, which will restore the um, lodge. Primarily, it will do plumbing, wiring, uh, um, handicapped accessibility, and, and seismic. And then the Friends and other donors, State of Oregon, will be working on the historic side of things and the furniture. So here we go. Um, of course, we know that Elijah traveled into the cave in 1874, and he apparently, the story goes, he was following his dog, and his dog apparently, Bruno, was trying to catch a bear. We never did learn whether um, he caught the bear. We do know that the dog came out safely, I think a day later, and Elijah got out safely. But if you've been in the cave recently, you'll know that they show um, how dark it gets, and he had three matches while he was in there, and he got out by following the water. And I think it's interesting that we are, we do have, of course, active water running through the cave at all times. Then there was a guy named Walter Birch. He heard about the caves in 1884, and he and his brother-in-law attempted to gain a title to the land and start giving tours. He was in the cave one day and he felt some wind coming in from the side. And he thought, wow, that, there might be more, more of a cave here. So he spent two days laying in a two inch deep pool of water, chipping through this hole until he could get it large enough that he could get through it and see that there was a huge amount of cave on the other side. The funny story about it is he had to remove his clothing to get through the hole because he just was so tired of chipping away that he was able to get through, but he had to leave his clothing behind. Um, and we know much earlier that um, the Tequilma Indians lived here for many years along the rich Applegate and Rogue River Valleys. However, we don't have any evidence of the um, of the Indians within the cave. I learned on a cave tour one day, and, I'm, and this is what I'm using, this is the story I'm sticking with, is that it could be because the Oregon cave faces north. And apparently, it, because it stays at a regular 44 degrees, it would have been too cold. And uh, the Native Americans chose to live in caves that face the south, which would be a warmer um, direction for the cave to go. So in 1906, President Roosevelt created the Antiquities Act which allowed um, a president to designate a monument. And a lot of people think it's, why are we not a park? We are a monument. A monument is designated by the president. Parks must be designated by Congress. There are over 421 properties in the Park Service, which includes historic properties, many other um, names, but we are what we call a monument and now a preserve, which is another designation that we also have. So in 1907, Joaquin Miller, poet of the Sierras, visited the Oregon Caves, and he wrote an article, The Marble Halls of Oregon, which we still use to this day in the Sunset Magazine. And in 1909, President Howard Taft designated the Oregon Caves, 480 acres, as a monument. It was the 21st monument created in the United States. There are now 158 monuments. Uh, president Obama created quite a few monuments. Each president has the option to do that. I think President Trump has designated one. Um, so the primary feature of the cave, it's a solution cave. If you're a geologist, which I'm not, my daughter is, but I can talk to some degree about this. It's formed when carbonite and sulfate rocks with slow moving groundwater and they drip. If you've gone into the cave, you'll notice we have these little straws and the, and the water drips slowly down through the straws. And so it creates stalagmites and stalactites. And our parent rock is what they call it, was actually um, limestone and then it metamorphosed to marble during the geologic process that also created the Klamath Mountains, including the Siskiyous. And the protection and restoration and interpretation of this cave is a karst landform. And if you're a geologist, again, that will mean more to you than it does to me, but um, that's the primary importance of it being a national monument. So between 1910 and 1919, it, we, were, we were a forest service, we were owned by the forest service from the beginning. Uh, Park service was not created until 1916. So we were um, managed by the forest service and they employed um, men to guard the cave after it was found, after it was found and created a monument, it gained, it gained more publicity at that point. And Dick Rowley 
So if, if you know much about the Oregon Caves, it, they still give the Dick Rowley tour so many years later. Um, you could visit on horseback and you can see here, people were coming over from Williams, um, about 2000 people a year would um, get a horse, would come over or they could go through Holland. If you're um, uh, aware of the Oregon uh, Cave Junction area, there's a, there's a small community now called Holland and you would um, call up uh, Mr. Fixley um, or you could call up, I'm going to give you this. Okay, this is an article in the Grants Pass Courier in 1919 on how you might visit the Oregon Caves. And it told you several ranchers who would give you horses and, and pack mules and you had to come um, with your candles. You had to be dressed, you had to come with overalls or old clothes and you should um, wear hobnailed shoes if you had them and that you could take a, a tour one time a day, and this was Mr. Rowley, um, and you couldn't pay him anything, you couldn't give him any tip because he was, he was hired by the Forest Service. But it would take um, sometimes two days to get to the Oregon Caves and, and people did it. And we think that's one of the most amazing things about the Oregon Caves is from the beginning, people were coming on horseback, taking two days. They had, there were no services at the Oregon Caves. They had to come ready to camp, bring all their food, and everything they needed for the time that they were there. Later, um, in about 1915, there were some camps created of this as one where you could, if you planned ahead, um, stay in one of these tents, but you had to phone and, and of course get there by horseback and have your own food and all your facilities because it was very limited on what the opportunities were. And then in 1916, I'm going to go back here for a minute. In 1916, the Park Service was actually created. And it was an interesting discussion between the Forest Service and the Park Service. Um, Forest Service wanted everything to be quiet, get away, camp, no development. They really weren't in supporting uh, any kind of resort activity happening in the national forest. So um, when the Park Service was created, their approach was a little bit more to say, we are going to designate larger areas with more developed opportunities for visitors. And so um, although the, forest, the Park Service was created in, in 1916, uh, we were still under Forest Service management. And then in 1922, the Redwood Highway opened, the, one, the road that we now go on. It was um, still a dirt road and it took two hours to travel the last 13 miles by car, but people were thrilled to do it. And then, of course, you've heard the Oregon Cavemen. Um, in 1922, they were created on a dare. And you can see here, um, Dad Ringate was one of the original seven founders. He was a grocery store owner in Grants Pass. And of course, to the right in the middle, you see our dear friend, Debs Potts, who was the mayor of Grants Pass and also a state senator. The Oregon Cavemen were all businessmen, pretty much from downtown Grants Pass. And there's a funny story about them wanting to be in the Rose Parade. They had never had a walking group in the Rose Bridge in Portland. You always had to have uh, some kind of a vehicle. And so they decided that they were going to go and ask if they could be in the, in the Rose Parade. And if you ever saw them in a parade, they had a rickety little cart that they took and they would grab people like me. My grandfather was a close friend of Debs Potts and, and he was giggling when they came to Lakeview because they came out and they grabbed me and put me in their little cart, grabbed me by my ponytail. And I was so scared. I'm surprised now that I have the patience to um, to kind of work with the Oregon Caves because they scared me to death. But anyway, so um, this group went to Portland and, and again, they were dentists and lawyers and, and, and very important businessmen from downtown Grants Pass. And they um, tried to decide whether they were going to go to the meeting with the Rose uh, Festival people as, as the cavemen or they were gonna go dressed in their suits. And so they decided they would go dressed as cavemen because that's what they want to show off. And then they were designated the opportunity to be the only walking group in the Rose Parade. And they maintained that um, status for quite a few years. But um, one of the cavemen was a dentist. And so they had gone into this meeting with their caveman outfits on and he made false teeth for all of them. And he had a very important business meeting following that meeting um, with one of his, uh, I think it was an investor in Portland and he went to the meeting and, and forgot to take out his false teeth. And so here he was a dentist with these terrible caveman false teeth in his mouth, which um, of course, you know, he probably didn't think was very funny, but we think it's a pretty cute story to tell after the fact. So we love the Oregon cavemen. Uh, they have received designation as one of the most effective promotional organizations for a community. 
I think maybe across the United States, they, they really had a lot of fun. Um, and they, they actually held a wedding in the Oregon Caves um, as a promotional um, effort. And um, it got apparently so much publicity all across the United States that um, other groups said, how could we do something similar to that? Because it was so much fun. And about two years ago, that was the only wedding that was ever held in the cave. You, you can't really do that. It's a federal property and it's not okay to hold a wedding in the cave. Well, about two years ago, our new superintendent, Jeremy, which I spoke of earlier, um, one day we were on the administration call and, and somebody said, well, did you hear there was a wedding in the, in the caves last week? And he goes, there can't be, how could that happen? Well, what happened is a family purchased a single tour, 14 of them purchased the whole tour, paid the money, took the, the groom, the bride, the best man, the maid of honor and the, and the minister and a few other people. And they just, in the middle of the tour, they had the, the tour guide stop and they <laughs> performed the wedding <laughs> and they came out. And so um, I guess there've been two weddings at the Oregon Caves that we're aware of, there may have been others. So, um, in 1923, the Forest Service granted a 20-year concession contract to the Oregon Caves Company. And uh, Sam Baker, who was with U.S. Bank in Grants Pass, the Voorhees family with the uh, Grants Pass Courier, uh, the owners of the Golden Rule, and the Harriman families, among several others, received this 20-year concession contract. And it's interesting to know because Timberline was a WPA uh, contract, and the Oregon Caves, everything was built privately by this company called the Oregon Caves Company. Um, so in 1923, in one year, they quickly built the chalet that you see the building there. It is now we, what we refer to as the visitor center. And then up above cabins, uh, they built the chalet for $5,000. It included kitchen, dining room, gift shop, and a dorm for women. And um, there was a men's dorm then created in 1926, which is up on the hill I don't have a picture of it here today. And um, they, there were no women guides at the time. Uh, women worked, could work in the park service as they did with us. They could be, um, they could cook, they could do many childcare, many opportunities, but they were not guides until about 47, one woman became a guide. And then in um, the 60s and 70s, they started to do more and then of course, like I said, Fran Manella in 2000 was the first woman head of the National Park Service. And it wasn't until 1978 that they were allowed to wear what they call the green and the gray. If again, Park Service refers to that as their uniform and, they, and the women did not have an official pin that they could wear. They had a separate uniform, it was a skirt, it was tan, they couldn't wear the hat. So finally in 1978, um, we considered that the women were of equal status. Also in 1926, the community of Cave Junction was created. And at that point, it was originally called Caves City. Um, it was in 1930 that they created electric lighting in the caves. And before that, they used candles. Um, and we do still hold a candlelight tour, I think on Sunday nights when the tours are going on. And the other interesting thing is you can see people here in this picture had on coveralls. And at one point there was a comment that they made more money renting the coveralls than they did actually for the cost of the cave tour. We also had a large contingency of the CCC between 1934 and 1941. They built many of the, um, most all of the rock work was done. You can see the photograph on the right is the as you exit a cave tour now, that is the trail that you come down from taking a tour. They also did, um, removed what they call headache rocks. If you've again taken a tour, you'll know that you can often hit your head on a rock. They um, created the tour stairs in the ghost room. If you remember, there's their stairway going up, but that's the largest room. And they were able to widen the tunnel that Mr. Birch had created so many years ago so that you can actually go through the two parts of the cave and, and get out. They also um, helped repair Highway 40, 46, and they uh, worked on picnic areas, many retaining walls, and a lot of mason work. They also did construct the telephone line to the Oregon Caves. And here's a picture now, a, more, a fairly recent picture of showing again the lighting and, and how beautiful the caves are inside. And actually, I want to clarify too, it is really just one cave, and we refer, refer to it often as the caves plural, but it really is only one, the, the cave that you tour is one single long cave. So that's just a piece of trivia. 
Um, of course, in 1932, or actually 31, they started the planning. The um, Oregon Caves Company decided that they wanted a um, inside lodge with indoor plumbing. And of course, this was the beginning of the depression. Now, this was a pretty big opportunity to, for them to undertake in, in that time. They built it over a period of two years at the cost of $50,000. One of the things that's most remarkable about it is you can see that it was built over a canyon. Um, they're in very limited space. Other options would have been to put it up on the hill, which the cabins were finally removed because they started to slide down the hill. So it was important to find a location and Gus Liam, uh, who was a local builder, really not a trained architect, but was very, very skilled in architecture, uh, designed and built the chateau. As you see it now, it's six stories. Of course, you come in on the third floor, as you can see, and it looks much smaller as you drive around than it does going up. Another interesting factor is um, he was actually the brother-in-law of Sam Baker, who was chairman of the board. And you often hear how something like that might happen, but fortunately, he was highly skilled and he built uh, quite a few different locations in downtown Grants Pass as well. And I can't remember any of them right now, but I know he was really well known and well regarded as a builder. So the, um, it, it, let's see, let me go here now. There we go. Here's just kind of a fun sepia tone picture. A lot of our photos back then were of course black and white. And this just shows you um, kind of what it looked like in some of the pictures that we had. Um, between 1938 and 1978, the um, Oregon Caves Company hired students to work uh, at the caves every summer. There were 40 women and 20 men. It was the hottest job to have if you were a single man in anywhere in the region. They said 40 women, 20 men, and, no, and, and we can't leave the place. I mean, we're all going to be stuck up there. Well, as it turns out, they come back often, and they're just the most incredible People. They were very brave. Some of them came across the United States. They now are professors, uh, attorneys, doctors. Many, they've all gone on really to find incredible professional careers. But at the time, it was just an incredible group of young people. And as you can see in the bottom picture, they also had to come with a musical talent. Uh, in the evening, they would perform around the campfire to the guests. And it was one of the most popular things. They have come back recently. There's one group that comes back every five years. There's seven marriages among that, about three year period of time. And they perform some of the skits they performed back then. And, and one time, um, a couple of years ago, one of them said, you know, these were a lot funnier when we were 18, 19, 20 and 21 than they seem to be now. But anyway, they were just a delightful, delightful group of people. So now um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what's going on currently. We are in a position of um, finally, after 12 years, uh, gaining federal support for what we're calling life safety and accessibility upgrade. That means we will be improving plumbing, wiring. There'll be an extra staircase added. There'll be an elevator. We will have uh, five rooms that will be handicapped accessible. You will be able to take the elevator down to the, to the dining room and also down to a lower room that was a staff cafeteria uh, from 38 to 78. We have restored that now into a community room. So we're hoping that if you are a, a guest at the lodge in the evening, we could have um, movies. We might have yoga classes in the morning. We are also hoping to work with the Coos Bay Culinary Institute and maybe bring in guest chefs. And we might also have cooking classes in the evening. We have uh, we put in a, a commercial kitchen down there and we're hoping that the new concession will um, embrace the idea of making the Oregon Caves even a greater community opportunity. So the design of the building is, is in the National Park Service referred to as architecture, meaning it just looks like the building grew up out of the ground. And this is one of the most remarkable things about the Chateau is that it does look like that. And um, it's, uh, let's see, and again, uh, one of the remarkable things is the use of the space. It's just, it's just amazing that it's still um, it's in such great shape as it is and that it, that it withstood so much um, pressure over the design of it being in the canyon. I mean, that's pretty risky to think about doing that. Um, this is an example of the original interior. This was probably not long after the, the um, 
lodge actually opened, we know that um, if you visit now, there are sconces. You can see the little square at the corner in the um, column. And now, uh, sooner, sooner, soon, soon, they created sconces for each of the of those. So we know this must have been one of the very first days it opened. We still have all this furniture, and of course, it's called Monterey furniture. It was made in by the Mason Manufacturing Company in Los Angeles for lodges, movie stars. Many, many movie stars, uh, Will, Will Rogers, Bill Lugosi, um, Art Linkletter, had uh, Monterey furniture in their homes. We will have the largest collection of Monterey furniture in the United States. Most of the furniture is in private homes, so we'll have the largest public collection. And as if you look at the two chairs there that are right in front of the fireplace, we still have those two chairs just exactly as they are. We think they have the original upholstery on them, partly because they're so uncomfortable to sit in that probably few people did sit in them, but they're referred to as Bella Lugosi chairs. Apparently those were designed for him for his dining room. You can also see the fireplace and actually the beautiful staircase to the left. It is one of the most remarkable features of the Oregon Cave Chateau. And of course the columns, many of most, I think, of, these, of the materials that the Chateau was built were from right in the area, very, very much, very local. This is our goal. This was um, what the lobby looked like in 1950. It's warm and uh, engaging, and that is how the Chateau has always felt for the full 75 years it's been open. The furniture is, is aging. We still have these pieces. They, of course, don't look quite this good now, but we will be in the process of restoring them. We have done rest restoration of the lighting. They look exactly, we've had to do new shades, but they're beautifully done. And so we are excited about moving forward with that. Let me just go here. This is the original, one of the original rooms. We still again have all the furniture. We don't have any of the, we have two of the lamps left, very few. And we're wishing to, we had more lamps, but we don't have very many lamps. So this gives you an idea of the collection of furniture. It is now in Grants Pass in the Parkway Village. We are, Invent we have in completely inventoried all the pieces that we own, that the Park Service owns, and then we also have um, quite a large collection of donated pieces that have come into the Friends. The picture in the left is Geraldine Ness. She is the wife of our current board chair. In 1997, she and her family came to visit the Oregon Caves, having no idea that it had Monterey furniture. Geraldine and Bernie have 240 pieces of Monterey furniture of their own collection. He was outside. Um, she was outside unpacking the car while Bernie was checking in, and um, she saw a, 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 wood, um, a maintenance worker standing on a Monterey chair, and she went over to him and she said, what are you doing standing on that Monterey chair? And the poor guy was just shocked, like, who is this? What are you saying to me? And then she came into the lodge and started turning over all the furniture in the lobby saying, Bernie, it's Monterey furniture. So what she was our first person to inventory the furniture and to actually alert the Park Service to the value of this remarkable collection. And the picture she's holding is a picture of George Mason, who is the design, was the designer of the furniture. It was taken after a movie poster that was created and, and created mostly for movie stars moving to the West. They wanted kind of a Western fun style of furniture and it was very successful for the period of time that they, that they created it. Now we have interest by the Smithsonian because we will have the largest public collection and they're interested in it being, of course, a um, US made, one of a kind for a short period of time, remarkable furniture. These are some examples of, of some of the pieces that were in the lodge. The, uh, the top left-hand corner, the green is one of the examples of the Spanish green. We, have, we will have probably two rooms of that. The orange in the middle uh, was something that came to us as a donation. And we said, well, this, this just doesn't look like, like it would be Monterey, but it is stamped Monterey. As you can see on the right, the brand is what's on all the pieces. And we did do further research to find that this is in fact one of the styles. What, what the Mason Manufacturing Company was, was just a small mom and pop company trying to make money. And they made different styles, sometimes just one or two pieces of a particular style. In the bottom left-hand corner is a beautiful piece that we, um, it's a, I'll show you another picture of it, but it just shows you some of the detail of the art and the design on the pieces. The top right hand corner is one of our newly restored shades and we're very pleased with the quality 
that we found for the people to do that for us. And so the, the, all the, the lighting has now underway to be restored. And the bottom right-hand corner is just another example of a chair that was donated. Um, and here, again, more styles. We are currently working on designing each of the 25 rooms to have a particular style. In the, in the last probably 15 or 20 years, if you've stayed at the lodge, all the pieces have been mixed up, different styles have been mixed up. And so now we have um, received about 100 pieces donated. We still need more. If some of you have Monterey furniture in your closet or you know a relative that does and, and they would like to uh, make a donation, we're just more than happy to receive it. If you look at the, the, um, the, the, the uh, on the top left-hand corner, you can see that there's an M, look very closely, on the metal. And that is very rare. Uh, it is one of the examples of a detail that the Monterey Furniture did have. And we do have quite a few pieces with those, with those particular bolts on them. And the bottom left-hand corner is Ramon Ramirez. He does, he is the best well-known Monterey Furniture restoration professional. He does all of Diane Keaton's work. She currently has, is one of the most well-known people that does have Monterey furniture. And it just shows the kind of work we, we are excited that he has accepted our offer to work with us in the restoration. This is another example of some that we, that was donated. This chair is an example of in 1964, uh, December of 1964, all the uh, furniture in the dining room went down the canyon with the flood. If um, you remember that terrible winter um, or day. Um, it was a lot of snow and then suddenly it warmed up and a big bunch of ice and snow was coming down through the canyon and they broke out the windows on the level where the dining room was and, and, and the ice and snow went through the lodge. It did not, um, well, it took the lodge off its foundation just a couple of inches and they thought it was lost, but the uh, then general manager's son was an engineer at OSU and he came up and with two D9 cats. So as we hear, they wrapped it with the cable and they inched it back on half an inch a day till it was back on its foundation and it has been perfectly stable ever since. So we had a hard time finding um, real examples. And so these are examples of the actual dining room chairs. And um, our dear friend, Ron Fox, who I spoke of earlier, was in charge of a project. He thought of this and he, and he did all the work for it to recreate the dining room chairs. And so you can see on the left, those, that's the original dining room. And then on the right are the newly created chairs. Um, if you're interested and we can, you know, you can go to our website, we can talk about this, but um, you do have the opportunity to sponsor a chair. You can sponsor it in honor of someone in your family. And there will be a donor plaque on each of these chairs. We have yet to decide how they're going to be finished. Again, Ramon will recommend to us how that's done. All the finish on the furniture is an applied finish. So this is, we're pretty excited about this project. And of course, we are the birthplace of the Viewmaster. Um, if any of you um, have Viewmasters, we, we um, actually, <laughs> it was created over dinner, uh, over on a napkin, you might say, um, by, um, Mr. Gruber and Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves was the vice president of the Sawyer um, Postcard Company and Mr. Gruber was a photographer. Mr. Gruber went on to create, which is I think still used in medical school. He was really a scientific photographer and he photographed cadavers uh, to the point where um, such detail that most medical schools did use and some still do use his 3D photography of, of the cadavers. Um, he um, was on his honeymoon, so the story goes, and um, his wife made a wish that things would turn around for them. They were having a bit of trouble. I think he was working as a piano tuner at the time, really wishing to do his photography. And of course, then they created the, um, the Viewmaster. And on the left, in the little picture, you can see we, for the night 2016, uh, 100th anniversary of the Park Service, we created our own uh, set which has historic photographs in it. And you can, we sell those as a fundraiser for, toward the restoration. And it did win. We were kind of excited it won the award of the most uh, unusual and educational um, um, toy, they called it, in um, well, uh, Fish and Wildlife Forest Service and Park Service. Um, there's a Public Lands Alliance group honored us with that. So we have a good time with it. And of course we have them on our website. And then probably one of the most exciting things that's happened most recently is the state of Oregon, the Cultural Advocacy Coalition. And if you 
if you see your legislators, tell her thanks, uh, whoever your legislator might be, for the fact that we even do this. Peter Buckley, who was in the legislature for quite some time, decided that it would be nice if the legislature would fund and support cultural organizations, but they didn't want them all to come in individually. They thought they put together this one effort. So we tried this out in 2017, and we did get support to match the Centennial Fund, and we are bringing back the balconies, and it, we're just so excited. They were taken off in 1950. Due to the snow and ice, they were very hard to manage, plus they were wood, and they're, they'll be coming back with the metal structure underneath, but they'll look like they do here. So if you go up, uh, when we open back up, you can have dinner on the balcony. Like I said, you can have an event down in the community room and you can sit out at the lobby level as well. So we're very excited about this, this opportunity that um, we're working on. And then I guess I would say, just to, um, I, can, I can update you quickly on where we are with the restoration project. The, um, we've had several delays. Uh, we closed the lodge actually in 2018 in, in anticipation of starting. But due to several government shutdowns, we kept getting delayed in putting out the bid to um, get the contractor as well as to complete the architectural design. So as of about three weeks ago, um, we actually, actually a month ago, because it was um, right before the fire started, we were actually in the chateau with the fences up and the work was beginning. And now, of course, we've been delayed because of the fire, but uh, we are back in there now. We just started uh, thinking about how to begin again a couple days ago. We'll probably do some kind of a blog or something. I really don't know. Maybe you guys could advise me how to do that to keep people posted on, on how the restoration's going because it's very exciting. The Oslin Group will be doing the work under the advisement of, of course, the Park Service, the Denver Service Center. And then we have a wonderful couple that, that works between Park Service and, and the um, contractor. The friends are responsible for the historic fabric of the lodge, that means the drapes, the furniture, the carpeting, the lighting, all the many um, historic details that you think of when you stay there. And so that, um, and then of course the restoration of the furniture, that's probably, we're probably about 93% of our fundraising completed. I think we need about between 600 and a, and a million dollars to complete that part of the project. Um, we're also creating an advisory group in Josephine County. If anyone is interested, my email is at the last slide, but we really wanna hear from you if you worked up there, if you have photographs, if your friends have photographs, if your family have photographs, if your mother worked up there, anything we can find, any ideas. Also um, woodworkers, if you're interested in some of the work on the furniture, we will have some, some things that we need to have done. And just generally, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Like I said, we have a place in Grants Pass with social distancing. Um, we will occasionally meet there, but otherwise we'll be having Zoom educational events and some other opportunities for you to get involved. So I thank you very much for inviting me to come to do this today. And I guess, I hope I've allowed some time for questions. So thank you. Yeah, we have a few minutes for question. You actually, uh, we've had two attendees put in the chat box that they worked summers at the caves. Oh, great. Um, Jan said that she worked there for a short while as a college sophomore until she had to go back and help her family farm. And then Bonnie said that she worked there in summer of 1972. She was in the kitchen as a pantry Ooh. girl and dishwasher. And she said she has menus from the dining room for, from that summer. So Bonnie, maybe you could send them to Sue. Uh, she could that see. would be wonderful. Yes, we just love, we love hearing the stories. You have history that we'll never have. And so it's so important that you share that with us and, and you know, be a part of moving forward. Uh, it's all of every decision that was made, every person that worked there, we want you to feel like it's still partly your, I mean, it is, it is your monument. We all own it. And we want all of you to be involved as much as we possibly can as we do the restoration. So thank you.